evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people here for our first event of term. Um, we're going to start off with a very brief introduction and remarks from Lord Newberger before we move on to questions. Very brief, maybe slightly optimistic, but I'll try and keep it reasonably short. I know that a lot of you are lawyers, and a lot of you may not be lawyers, and what I will be talking about is Brexit, the judges, and the rule of law. And quite a lot about the rule of law may be pretty well known to some of you who are lawyers. Um, if, you're, if it's not, you should be grateful to me for telling you about it. But more seriously, um, I look forward to the questions, and please don't feel restrained by what I'm talking about. Any questions are very welcome. The rule of law is a, a, a slippery concept, but the rule of law and democracy are the two fundamental pillars of our uh, system of government. There's the expansive view of the rule of law, which is the Tom Bingham version in his excellent book, My Predecessor But One. Uh, he was a senior law lord. It includes the rule of law, he thinks, includes fundamental rights effectively enshrined in the Human Rights Convention. The more basic version, the narrower version of the rule of law, is a society governed by laws, properly made, properly administered, and properly applied. And as anyone who knows anything about the Constitution, any Constitution knows, properly made laws are made publicly and in clear terms by the legislature, Parliament. Properly administered means properly run by answerable, uncorrupt, and competent executive, mostly civil servants, run by ministers, and properly applied means properly enforced and decided on by courts with judges who are independent, honest, and competent. <laughs> now, traditionally in the UK, the separation of powers is fine so far as the judges are concerned. The judges are completely separate from the executive, the civil service, and from the legislature, parliament. But of course, there's not separation of powers between the executive and parliament. The top tier of the executive is the cabinet. Ministers are heads of their department, if you like, and they are in parliament. The judge's fundamental role of resolving personal and commercial disputes, family disputes, neighbor disputes, and the like, resolving criminal cases, enforcing the criminal law, but seeing fairness to defendants, and the increasingly important public law role, protecting individuals against excesses of increasingly powerful governments, are essential for peace on the streets and essential for economic prosperity. Now, in almost every country in, this, in the world, the judges' functions, and indeed everyone's functions, including Parliament's functions, are carried out within the framework of a written, coherent constitution, a Bill of Fundamental Human Rights, this is un not true of three countries, Israel, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has no written coherent constitution. I think that's because for 325 years we've had no invasion, no tyranny, no civil war. We've survived in that happy state when many countries, such as Germany, Italy, and the United States, didn't even exist 325 years ago. But constitutions and bills of rights only became fashionable in the later part of the 18th century. And as countries pulled themselves up from invasions and so on, they had constitutions. The UK never needed it. So it seems to me that we are, if you like, the product, our system is the product of our history, which in turn is the product of our geography, the reason we haven't been invaded successfully for a thousand years nearly, is because ultimately we're an island. I think we have very few constitutional principles, actually. The first is that laws can only be made by the Queen in Parliament, i.e. by statutes made in Parliament and signed off by the monarch. And the second is independence of the judiciary. And independence works two ways. Importantly, the judges can't get involved in what goes on in Parliament. We keep our noses, judges keep their noses out of what goes on in Parliament, and Parliament and the civil service have to keep their noses out of what goes on in courts. So the courts are less powerful in the United Kingdom than in countries with a constitution. The United States 
the United States Supreme Court famously can override statutes even if they've been passed by the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the President, all democratically elected. But if they're unconstitutional, courts can strike them down. We can't do that. We get round that, the judges get round that by what Baldrick might call a cunning and subtle plan of being able to interpret statutes. And sometimes we interpret them quite, um, uh, quite uh, imaginatively, uh, so as to, as we see it, comply with the rule of law. One example of that, which some of you may have seen, was uh, the decision of the Supreme Court on the Prince of Wales letters, the Evans case, where literally read the statute said that the Attorney General, a Minister of the Crown effectively, could override the decision of a, a, a court of judges. And we said, the majority of us said, if Parliament wants to say that a member of the executive can do that, it has to spell it out in the clearest possible terms. And we don't accept it has done it as clearly as it should. David Cameron, the Prime Minister at the time, said he would change the law, overrule the court, but never did. Illustrates another point, that if judges in our system change the law or make law that Parliament doesn't like, we have parliamentary supremacy, Parliament can overrule the judges. The judges can't do the same to Parliament. The odd comment in the Jackson hunting case and in other various articles suggests that if Parliament passed a peculiarly uh, disgraceful statute, uh, however clear it was, the judges might not apply it. Uh, I hope we never come to have to test that, but at the moment, the general accepted position is judges can't override Parliament. Now, up to about 50 years ago, the judges were very quiet. If you read the famous work on, um, by, by Badgett on the British Constitution written in the 1870s, there are various chapters about various parts of the government. No mention of the judges. And even 50, 60 years ago, the judges, although the Elizabethan Francis Bacon called them the lands under the throne, even 60 years ago, the lands didn't roar. Indeed, looking back on it, the only sound you'd have heard from the judicial lands was snoring. But around 1966, 900 years after the Battle of Hastings, and since then, things have changed. The judges have got much more, if you like, powerful or influential. It started with an enormous growth of judicial review. That is, judges reviewing and overriding decisions made at various levels of government, all the way from ministers down to local planning authorities, and quashing their decisions if they didn't comply with the law. I think that the judges did this much more for a number of reasons. One was the executive had got more and more powerful. Secondly, I think that people had got more and more ready after the Second World War and after life had calmed down to get more assertive of their rights, had got more educated and more informed. And thirdly, with the 1960s, a period none of you can remember, but I can, uh, people got much more questioning, much more disrespectful and people were much more ready to challenge the government. And over the years, from 1960 to 2000, those 40 years, the number of cases where the government's decisions were challenged increased from a few tens a year to almost 10,000 a year. But other things were happening too, not just the judges. The courts were given a new constitutional power in the 1990s when we had devolved government. For the first time, the courts were called upon to decide whether Edinburgh or Cardiff or Belfast had the power to make laws or the laws resided in Westminster still. The lawmaking power resided in Westminster. That was a sort of constitutional power which the courts hadn't had. So devolution gave power. Then the judges were given more autonomy with the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, which took away the Lord Chancellor's control over the judiciary, the Lord Chancellor being a government appointment, now effectively no more than the Minister of Justice, and gave more power to what became the President of the Supreme Court in UK terms and the Lord Chief Justice in terms of English law. And, of course, the Supreme Court was formed. And then other statutes, such as the Freedom of Information Act, 
gave judges more power than they'd had, a quasi-constitutional power, over uh, the executive. And then, of course, there was the European dimension. Although the UK had signed the European Convention on Human Rights in 1951, it wasn't part of our law. This illustrates a point I made earlier. Laws can only be made for this country by Parliament. So the government, the executive, the prime minister, the foreign secretary can sign a treaty and agree to do things. That's utterly effective in international law, but it's no part of our law until Parliament, as it were, hoiks the treaty into our law and makes it part of our law. And that's what happened in 1998 when Parliament passed the Human Rights Act. And suddenly, human rights became part of our law. And this gave judges significantly more power in terms of a, giving people many more rights, the right to privacy, the right of free speech, and so on, extending the right which we previously had relating to false imprisonment, and other rights were extended, and this gave greater power. It also gave the judges greater power to judge the, not merely the procedure under which a decision had been made by government, but the actual decision itself. So a judge could say, the decision, when you balance the importance of the human right that was being infringed compared with the importance of the decision itself, it was not justified. That wasn't the sort of decision judges could make before. And judges could, as it were, poke their noses into areas which previously they couldn't do. It was far more revolutionary to have human rights in this country than it was in any other European country because we didn't have a constitution. Other countries with constitutions had most of these rights already. And that's why human rights became such a political issue in this country. The other reason it became a political issue was because, not because of anything to do with the Convention on Human Rights, but because it was the European Convention on Human Rights, and there was a build-up of concern about the other aspect of uh, our law that got changed since 1966, which was EU law. And of course, for the first time, judges were able to override in this country statutes made in Parliament contrary to the notion of parliamentary sovereignty because of uh, the uh, EU law having supremacy. Now this wasn't actually a breach of parliamentary sovereignty because Parliament told the judges they could do that in the European Communities Act 1972 just as much as the judges were given the powers under the Human Rights Act by Parliament. They didn't take it. They didn't take those powers. But the effect of Euro law, as it were, supplanting or overriding English law, the effect of the European Court and the European Parliament's laws, the directives and regulations made in, 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 in Luxembourg, in Brussels, in Strasbourg, overriding um, our law, uh, led to strong feelings in some quarters. And eventually, as we all know, it led to a referendum to try and lance the boil about what we did about Europe. And what I wanted to end on was to say why I think we're in such a mess now, why the referendum has caused such problems to our political system. I think the first problem is that referenda are alien to our system. I said earlier we have parliamentary supremacy. If you have a re up to now, we haven't had many referenda, but the referenda we've had have all gone the way that the majority of Parliament wanted. So there wasn't a clash between the result of the referendum and what Parliament or the government wanted. This time, we do have such a clash. And we're in unknown territory because it undermines the whole notion of parliamentary sovereignty that we should be doing what Parliament should be forced to do, what it doesn't want to do. Secondly, Nobody actually knew what Brexit meant. We all knew what remaining meant, but nobody knew what, re what, what, what Brexit meant. It could have meant leaving without a deal, as we all know, leaving with a deal on the and staying in the customs union, etc. There was no actual decision about what would happen. And this is linked to the fact that the Referendum Act didn't say what would happen if we voted to leave. The Scottish independence referendum, which took place two years earlier, was carried out under a statute which had a carefully set out plan as to what would happen if the Scots voted to leave uh, the UK. 
So the Scots knew what they were voting for, and Parliament knew, and the executive knew, and the judges would know what would happen if Scotland voted to leave, if the change was going to happen. Nothing about that in the referendum. But it goes further than that. In relation to the Referendum Act for, the, for leaving the EU, the actual referendum had absolutely no legal effect as a matter of law. When we had the Miller case, which involved the question of could the government serve Article 50 notice to leave the EU, not even the government was able to rely on the referendum result as an argument as to why they should be able to do it. It was, technically speaking, as a legal exercise, irrelevant. And yet, Morally, politically, if you like, many people regard it as not merely relevant, but decisive on the issue. So that's another problem, if you like. Another problem, which is slightly different in nature, is that the division in Parliament is not along party lines. In a whipped, essentially two-party system, which is what we're all used to in this country, you may have outlying MPs with different views, but what we're not used to is... Uh, an issue which divides and a fundamental political issue we've had social issues like abortion but a fundamental political issue which divides parties down the middle and this too I think is a highly discombobulating factor then we have the fact that the government served the article 50 notice without actually working out what it wanted and two years no doubt when you serve a notice when you're at the beginning of your second year before your finals seems a long period, but it's horrifyingly quick. How you get there horrifyingly fast. And I think it was very unwise to serve the notice without working out what we wanted. And I think the excitement that was whipped up by the newspapers, by blogs, by the internet, Russian influence, Cambridge Analytica, has not made things any better. In other words, the timing was very unfortunate in that if we'd had the referendum, say, 15 years earlier, when the internet and blogs and various means of influencing people subconsciously were relatively unknown, uh, those influences would not have been as great as they have been. Even now, I suspect, we don't quite know their full effect. And then I'm afraid expectations were whipped up by ill-thought-out populist oratory, no deal better than the bad deal, red lines, etc. And then I think there's another different factor which is the different cast of mind between UK government policymakers and EU policymakers. What I think never quite got through to many people negotiating with the EU was that the EU is a legal construct. It has strict legal rules. The British approach, consistent with us not having a constitution, is we're very pragmatic, very practical. There's a deal to be made here, there's something to be done, you can get this, we can get that, we can fudge this, etc. And what I think people didn't quite realise, even after being in the EU for nearly half a century, was that that's not the way the EU thinks so much. Of course there's always a bit of negotiation, a bit of fudge, but there are genuinely red lines, which are not political red lines, but legal red lines. And the best example of that is the current problem over the fact that we are negotiating over a period where we have, um, to, have to take part in the Euro elections. That's the rules. We have absolutely no way of getting around them. And I think that, has, that difference of approach, that difference of mindset has heavily um, has played a significant part in the uh, difficulties which the negotiations have had. I think also the problem may be it, it's very difficult, indeed, I think impossible, to find any solution uh, to the Brexit uh, question as to what sort of Brexit you want, how you want to engineer it, which is not in the short term going to make us worse off than staying in the EU. I can't speak about the long term, none of us know what the long term holds, but the short term, it's pretty clear from the government figures that any deal, or other than staying in, is going to make us worse off, and that inevitably makes a negotiation and deciding what we want to do difficult. So here we are, 34 months after the referendum, more than two years after serving our two-year notice, 25 days after we should have left, we have no more idea about what's going to happen than we did the day after the referendum. 
One consequence of this is that democratic government risks being a little unstable and losing respect. But this means that the rule of law, which the judges, not only the judges, but the judges in particular stand for, are particularly important and play a particularly vital feature. Throughout my career as a judge, until the Brexit business, I thought the rule of law was rather overlooked. Maybe now people will value it for more uh, than they did in the past. And it's right to end with this comment. Brexit is destabilizing and a problem. But in a way, the worst thing about it is that it ultimately diversionary from the many of the long-term issues which are ultimately, I suspect, more important to you starting on life, to the planet and to everybody uh, than Brexit. Your generation will have to face up to serious problems which the environment faces, which anyone who's been in London over the past couple of weeks will be well aware of, globalization, international political tensions, artificial intelligence, electronic communications, the gig economy. All those things are very significant and need all our attention and government attention. One of the tragedies of Brexit is we've lost three years concentrating on something which is not as important as any of those things. And yet, its effect on this country, Brexit, effect of Brexit on this country could be quite serious for the reasons I've tried to give. So, I've spoken long enough. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lord Newberger. So, earlier on in your speech, you talked about the relationship between the different branches, and you also talked about judicial independence. Now, at present, there are obviously lots of issues that are of great public importance. What do you see the role of judges in contributing to public debate to be at the moment in relation to some of these issues like Brexit that both have political and judicial implications, or legal implications, rather? Well, I think judges' position is quite difficult because, on the one hand, um, they have a particularly important function when democratic government and the system of government is seen to be a bit going through a rocky patch supporting the rule of law. And um, they have primarily to make sure that they carry out their functions as judges as competently, as uncontroversially, and as intelligently as possible. But I think there is a duty on judges, particularly senior judges, to speak out. I think we have to be very careful that not too many judges talk at the same time because there's a danger of mixed messages and people getting fed up with hearing them talk time and again. But I think judges also have to be careful about not getting involved in political issues. As a former judge, having stood down 18 months ago, there are things that I could say that I just said, which wouldn't have been appropriate for me to say as a judge. And I think it's very important that judges remember that however strongly they feel about something, they have to be very careful not to trespass into the politicians' area because they want the politicians to keep out of their area. But I think they have to speak up for the rule of law and they have to speak up for judicial independence. And it's fair to say that, in my view at any rate and in my experience at any rate, attacks on the judges directly, at least, by government is almost non-existent in this country. We're very lucky. You get the occasional, normally newly appointed Home Secretary saying something silly about a judgment, but it doesn't happen very often, and it, it, it's shut down pretty quickly. Where there are greater dangers for the judiciary is being undermined in a more subtle way. Um, judges are um, largely overworked, not well as, as well supported as they should be. And while most people would think judges are extremely well paid, there is a problem that we recruit judges on the whole from the most successful lawyers, and the most successful lawyers make a lot more money uh, than the most successful judges. And if you want somebody to become a judge, uh, and want somebody really good to become a judge, and give up a, a, a great deal of, of money to do so, a great deal of income to do so, you do have to make the job more attractive um, than has currently been done. The worst thing that's been done recently is basically to put new judges, high court judges, in a position where for complicated tax reasons, the pension, which was an attractive feature of the job, is now more expensive to take than it is to refuse. And since the 
government valued the pension at about 35, 36% of salary, it means that the judges have had a salary cut of 36%. And it's not the money mainly, although it is a factor, it's more the message it sends. We don't really care, says the government. And also, the, the, the court buildings are, are not in good shape, the judges aren't being given proper support. And while it sounds a bit trade union-y, I do think that if you start treating the judges badly, you're not going to get the best people becoming judges. And in the long run, I think the country suffers. And, you know, in, in relation to some of those themes, when the Miller case was going through the courts, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of media reaction to some of the judgments, particularly in, in the lower courts. What do you think of the current state of the regulations surrounding that and the law surrounding that and sort of media reporting in relation to cases that go through the court? I think one of the most difficult things these days to deal with is freedom of speech, freedom of expression, particularly freedom of the press. Um, if you start interfering with what the press can and can't say outside the laws of libel and privacy and so on, you are in danger of going down a slippery slope. On the other hand, if the press doesn't, as it were, self-regulate in a respectable way so that headlines such as enemies of the people when against judges who are doing their job uh, are, are allowed to proliferate, um, you then are in a really bad place if you don't do something about it. So fr I think freedom of, it's a, freedom of expression is a very difficult matter to handle. To be fair to the press, uh, the enemies of the people headline uh, attacking the judges who decided the Miller case in the divisional court appears to have been a one-off. We haven't had anything like that repeated. And while it is too much to expect the Daily Mail to say we got it wrong, um, the Daily Mail has at least not gone there again. And um, I do think we have to be very careful about freedom of the press. Of course, you've also got freedom of expression on the internet, which actually I regard as a much bigger problem, because most people, used to be the case with newspapers, are drawn to the blogs, to the news reports, and the op-ed type articles that suit their own particular prejudices, their own particular beliefs. And with the proliferation of uh, media information and available stories, and the um, uh, lack of any control which you can have uh, as against, say, newspapers, it's very difficult to know what to do about the internet. I expect gradually we, we're in a new world, we'll have to learn how to cope, but it, it's, uh, uh, it is a very difficult area. And, you know, on, on the themes of, of access to justice and speaking about the rule of law, in, in recent years particularly, the legal aid budget has been going down. You've had an increase in the number of litigants in person appearing in civil cases. How do you think this has, or what sort of an impact do you think this has had on civil justice? I should have mentioned that as a factor when I, you were asking me about justice, about being a judge. But undoubtedly, the cutting back of legal aid since 1999 has been, in my view, uh, worse than unfortunate. It's simply been wrong. From a selfish judge's point of view, it's meant that there have been many more litigants in person, which means that instead of having well-presented arguments put forward by lawyers who know what they're talking about, you have people coming to court who are acting for themselves and don't really understand what's going on and are either angry or frightened or upset or all three, and understandably so. On the more important issue, not the effect on judges, but the effect on justice, it's a very bad effect. You have to choose between acting for yourself, which as a non-lawyer is pretty frightening, or n simply not enforcing your rights. And the work that the law centres and citizens' advice bureaus do in giving people advice, providing it for nothing, as a, a charity, lawyers actually going to work in these places to give people advice it, and lawyers doing so in their spare time is admirable but that's not a way a legal system should work and the shrinking of legal aid has in my view been a, a very serious retrograde step over the past 20 years. Um, I think there's a duty on lawyers 
and anyone involved in law to mitigate this and to try and reduce, in small cases, the costs of litigation and getting legal advice. But the trouble is, we want the best people to be lawyers, we want highly able, talented, informed people to be lawyers, and we can't expect them to do it for nothing. And there are plenty of jobs out there that a good lawyer could do, which even now, paid as well as they are in many cases, they could make a lot more money doing other jobs, and yet they're prepared to be lawyers. But the people who are doing most of the criminal law and most of the family law and some of the less glamorous civil law uh, are, are, are paid ridiculously little for their expertise and hard work. And that's simply wrong. It's not in the public interest. And in the long run, we will regret it as a country. So early on, earlier on in your speech, you spoke about the, uh, how laws are enacted by statute in Parliament. But you know, in, in, in response to you know, comments about the fact that judges aren't merely sort of discovering the common law, but they're also making laws, how do you see the state of that interplay at the moment you know, between Parliament's enacting new laws, but also the relationship with the judiciary in continuously exploring and developing the common law? Yes, you're quite right. Um, in my thumbnail sketch, I didn't say much about the common law. Judges basically have two powers, as the lawyers will know. One is to interpret legislation, but there are whole areas of law where there's very little legislation where Parliament hasn't got involved. An obvious example is the law of contract. There are one or two laws relating to contracts. But generally speaking, contract law is judge-made. Another area is the law of torts, if you run somebody over or something like that, um, or commit a nuisance. Um, that is largely judge-made law. And judges have the power, particularly if they're in the Supreme Court, to develop the law, i.e. to change it. Um, and that is a, a, an important judicial power. I think in each case, um, judges have a duty, bearing in mind that they don't have democratic legitimacy or democratic accountability, to be careful about how they change the law and how they develop the law and how they interpret statutes. But they do have the safety net, and the public and parliament have the safety net of knowing that if, the judge, if a judge interprets the law or develops the law in a way which parliament doesn't agree with, parliament can have the last word. Parliament can override the judge, a judge's decision with a statute. Not always that easy to get the majority to do so, but it can do that. I think that the two work perfectly well together. A judge accepts that if parliament has legislated for a certain, in a certain area of law, then the judges have, can't get involved. They can interpret the law, but they can't develop the law, the common law, in a way that is inconsistent with statute. But where statute law doesn't go, the judges can happily go on interpreting, uh, in, in developing the law. And um, a final question for me before we move on to questions from the audience. You spoke about you know, the, the largely unwritten constitution that we have in the United Kingdom at present. Do you think... It's working. Do you think there are things that need to be changed, um, pieces of legislation? Well, undoubtedly, the pieces of legislation that could be changed. The big question is, should we bite the bullet and finally, after all these years, have a written constitution? I think there's a lot to be said for having a single statute which records things like devolution, rules about how Parliament gets voted in and out, and that sort of thing, which may not at the moment be in statute, or may be in different statutes, the Bill of Rights, a bit of Magna Carta still survives, we got the Act of Settlement, and so on. Try and at least have a coherent statute. I would not be in favour of an extreme version of a constitution which actually was superimposed on Parliament. I think we've already seen one of the problems with being a member of the EU, one of the reasons some people are anti-EU or pro-Brexit, was because you had something above Parliament. If we had a constitution above Parliament, I think that would be a step too far. But having some sort of document that records the law as it is, in a way that Parliament can change in a statute, I think would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. right. um, I'd like to invite questions from the floor. If you could just raise your hand and um, wait for a microphone. Join you. Yep. Um, on that side. Thank you, Lord Newberger. Probably one of the most famous judges in the last 50 years was Lord Denning. 
um, I'm curious if you have any comments about Lord Denning and his approach to developing the common law and equity. Thank you. Yes, I think you can take away the word probably. I think Lord Denning is the most famous judge since the Second World War and possibly probably in the whole of the 20th century and 21st century. Lord Denning was undoubtedly a great man and a great judge. Um, but some of the things he did were a bit too brave. Um, and I suppose you can say it was an inevitable consequence of him being um, adventurous and, and imaginative. Uh, it's almost inevitable that you'll go too far. I think he was, a, if one's going to be unkind, he was a, quite a good advertisement for the fact you shouldn't be a judge for too long. Because I think on the whole, his better work was in his earlier years and in his later years. But some of his judgments, even in his, in, the late, in his late 70s and early 80s, were very impressive. I think he was a remarkable figure, um, but like virtually any human being, not without flaws. Another question? Yep, just at the back there. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. It was uh, incredibly interesting. Um, so as we know, um, Britain, as you mentioned in your speech, doesn't have a lot of experience with referenda. Um, looking at other countries who have had a lot of experience with referenda uh, and how lawyers and judges have become involved in the processes uh, within those referenda and some of the novel approaches to referenda, such as citizens' assemblies, etc., it's a twofold question. Why do you think Britain walked so blindly into the Brexit referendum? And then also, do you think judges and lawyers had more of a responsibility in the lead up to the referendum in how it was conducted and how um, citizens, uh, information was disseminated to citizens during the referendum process? I, I think it's a very valid point that some countries that have democratic systems, an obvious one being Switzerland, um, manage very well with referenda. But that, I think, is for two reasons. One, it's part of their system. They've got a constitution that provides for referenda. Secondly, the result that they have specific, much more specifically directed questions, although, to be fair, joining the EU might well be, or leaving the EU if they were members, might well be a e referendum issue. But I think it illustrates an important point about so much to do with the law, and I suspect so many other areas of life, too that something that works in one country very well may be completely dysfunctional in another country. I'm not a gardener, my wife is, but the fact that a flower grows very well in your garden doesn't mean it'll grow well in mine. And I think that's true of referenda. But as I say, if they had had our referendum in Switzerland, uh, the referendum would have told you what was going to happen if you voted to leave. It wouldn't just have been left in the air with no legal effect at all. Um, I suppose that having got into the situation that we are, anybody who indulges in any sort of self-analysis or self-doubt will think to themselves, should I have said something at the time? For the reason I mentioned earlier in answer to a question from the chairman, I think it's quite difficult for judges to speak up about something like the referendum because it's such a political issue. For me or for another judge to have said, look, I don't think this referendum is being properly conducted, would have been trespassing into the political field. Um, my wife said I should have done something about it at the time, <laughs> but I tried to explain to her that really I, I didn't think it was right. But she got me into trouble because um, when the case came from the divisional court to the Supreme Court, some journalist discovered that my wife had been tweeting, she's quite a tweeter, um, and had been <laughs> tweeting, and she tweeted the day after the referendum. Uh, I think she said she merely forwarded the tweet or liked the tweet, but the, the tweet that the referenda were mad, bad, and dangerous to know. So um, it was said, therefore, I shouldn't have sat or shouldn't be sitting on the Miller case. Um, but, but it was assumed, no doubt, that like most judges, I was under my wife's thumb. But <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I think that there is force in the idea that some people might have spoken up, but no doubt anybody who might have spoken up will be giving the same answer as I'm doing, which is, it wasn't really for me, it was for somebody else. 
But I do think that the judges would have been criticised and understandably criticised and seen as politicised if they had spoken up. Any other questions? Yep, so the friend here. Um, if you could just wait for a microphone. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Newberger, for that. Um, a criticism often levelled at the judiciary is the lack of gender and ethnic diversity. Do you think that a more diverse judiciary makes better law, and what relevance uh, do judges sort of bring their experience into making decisions have? I think that we do need and should have a much more diverse judiciary, particularly when you look at the senior judges. The, the diversity is not too bad when you look at the tribunals and so on, but as you go up the system, it gets worse. I think, first of all, you should have greater diversity because it's simply unfair not to, to sign of unfairness. And for a group of people concerned with justice, it's pretty ironic that it's not uh, fair. Secondly, by definition, if you're not, haven't got a, a, represent, a decent representation of all groups, Statistically, it must mean you haven't got all the best people you could have. So that's the second reason. And third reason is that I think in terms of public acceptability, which is vital for justice, uh, it, it, it undermines the acceptability of the judges. So for those three reasons, I strongly supported that increased diversity. I am not convinced that um, increased diversity will make different law for the reasons I've given, it will improve the quality a bit. But beyond that, I'm not convinced. It might change the law. I doubt saying it wouldn't, but I remain to be convinced. In defense of the system, I would say this. When it comes to the senior judges, that is the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court, the tradition has been very much that you pick from the legal profession, and in particular, from the bar. Concentrating on women initially, the... When it comes to QCs, 13% are women. The number of high court judges who are women, I think, is 24%. Now, I wouldn't boast about 24%, it should be 50%. But given the pool they're fishing in has half that percentage, little more than half, it does suggest that steps are being taken to try and improve the situation. Um, and I think a lot of the problems lie with the legal profession. Again, it's easy to knock the legal profession because the legal profession has to answer to clients and to keep clients happy. And the truth is, over the period I've been uh, uh, in the law, um, the 24-7 availability of lawyers has increased uh, the requirement, for, or perceived requirement, that lawyers are available all the time for the clients has increased enormously. And the world we live in, although it's changing, a bit, I, I can't measure how much, but looking at my children, it's clearly changing. But the world very much was that if you had a family, if you had elderly parents, it tended to be the woman rather than the man, if, in a, in a, if there was a woman, heterosexual relationship, tended to be the woman who was not available 24-7. Also, I think women are saner than men. And um, it's the men who are so obsessed with promotion, etc., and earning who are more likely to work 24-7. Again, that's a gross generalisation because there are plenty of women who, aren't like, who are like that. There are plenty of men who are more relaxed. But in the bell curve approach to life, I think there is that difference. But I think that the solution to it lies as much with the legal profession. And the legal profession can say to me quite fairly, the solution doesn't merely lie with the profession. It lies with their clients um, having to accept and there are, I think, particularly in America, clients who are very picky about the lawyers they go to, want to see that, that women are properly represented in the top echelons of the law firm. And the same sort of comment about um, ethnic minorities, figures are slightly different, but the striking thing about women is that the entry to the legal profession is more than half women, solicitors just under half women at the bar, and you go to the top, and even in solicitors, the top law firms, 13% of the partners are women. It's the same sort of figure. So it is a problem. Ethnic minorities and, um, if you like, socioeconomic background are another problem. 
and the socio-economic background is particularly grave because the problem comes, well, you, you all know, it, it, it happens about getting into university. The problem is then, what is the legal profession when it comes to entry there to do about it? But we do have a problem in this country, a very serious problem, about privilege backgrounds, and I think that also relates to ethnic minorities. Sorry, it's a long answer. Another question? Yep, just in the front here. Um, in the front, yeah. Um, thank you very much, that was really good. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, the European influence and input that we have um, in our laws, and that perhaps was one of the reasons that a lot of the population um, voted to leave the EU. So I was just wondering what was your view um, on how far EU law has impeded on parliamentary supremacy? Well, I think, I think my view is honestly that it, it hasn't in the sense that it's rather like my view on sovereignty. How we can say that parliamentary supremacy has been seriously impeded by European law when it's parliament that's chosen through the European Communities Act to say that European law should have the fa that effect and now we see parliament being able to say we take back what we gave to Europe. So they never really lost it. They chose to, in a sense, if you like, it's rather like talking about losing sovereignty as I see it. We didn't so much lose sovereignty when we were in the EU. We pooled our sovereignty or part of our sovereignty with other European countries to be part of a bigger block. Like if you play hockey or football or netball, uh, you give up some of your independence to play in a group. And that's what it involved. So I've never really seen it as, as being a serious uh, interference because you can always leave the game and assert your own independence if you want to. So I, I, I don't see it as really losing that sort of control. In terms of the laws, I suspect if you asked somebody who was criticising the Court of Justice in Luxembourg to name a, identify a single case which they felt the Court of Justice had got wrong and interfered with our sovereignty or our rights, they couldn't mention it. They'd probably mention a case decided in the Strasbourg Court, the Human Rights Court. There are decisions of the European Court of Justice that I disagree with, but they're on the whole fairly technical. Um, as for the regulations, well, there are a lot of regulations that come out of Brussels, and most of them are pretty sensible and unobjectionable. Some of them some people wouldn't like, and some of them I don't think are very sensible. But that's true of laws made at Westminster as well, and anywhere else. I don't see it as particularly threatening. The areas where European law, EU law, has a particular effect are rather hit and miss. Employment, VAT, and equal rights. And one or two small aspects of, of course, freedom of movement, and very much competition law. Um, but whole swathes of law, it has no real uh, influence. And for most people's ordinary lives, I think unless they are VAT pairs, uh, EU law doesn't really come in very much other than it's helped employees quite a bit. And it's done quite a bit for the environment. Another question? Yep, just there. And I think one point I'd make while well, that is worth making is that we've influenced Europe as well as Europe influencing us. You go and talk to the Court of Human Rights judges, you go and talk to the European Union Court judges, and they have got much more interested in the doctrine of precedent following their own previous decisions, for example, thanks to our involvement in the EU and our involvement in human rights than they were previously. It's been a two-way influence. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead of you. In your speech, you spoke about the problem in a potential disparity between the result of a referendum and the will of parliament. But if parliament is deriving its authority from democracy, 
how can it be seen as problematic that they're being forced by the will of the people? Because, first of all, the basic rule is that you get elected as an MP and you go to Parliament and you do what you think is right. If your constituency doesn't like you, your constituency party doesn't like you, the voters don't like you, or what you've been doing in the time you're in Parliament, they vote you out. But you're not there to simply to give the views and vote along the lines of the views of your constituents. Equally, if an MP wants to do that and wants to say, every time I vote, I'm going to consult my constituents and I'm going to vote the way they want, he or she would be entirely entitled to do that. But an MP is a free agent and is free to do what he or she thinks is right uh, on any particular, uh, uh, any particular vote. Um, the referendum um, then trumps that because if you feel, as an MP, do you feel you have to vote on the, for instance, on Brexit, the way your constituency voted or the way your country voted? And if your country, do you treat your country as England or Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland? It's quite conflicting. And particularly if you're told that the referendum was purely consultative and has no legal effect, what then do you do? It's a perfectly respectable view you put forward. An MP and many MPs have it, that my duty is to vote for Brexit because my constituencies, constituencies, but constituents voted that way or because the country voted that way. I'm not saying that's not a respectable view. It is. But it's an equally respectable view is I've been voted to do what I think is right as an MP. And that is the view which was propounded by Edmund Burke. Uh, in the late 18th century, and a view which I think most people subscribe to. It's not inconsistent with saying, I've been voted in to do what I think is right, and what I think is right is to do what my constituents want. But equally, you can say, I feel strongly about this, I know my constituents vote, voted one way, but I think the right decision is the other way. If they want to throw me out, that's their right. Another question? Yep. In the gallery. Hi. Um, if you could just wait for a microphone. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for the speech. It was really interesting. I was actually quite intrigued by your statement that you think that having a supreme constitution would be ill-suited or inadequate for the UK. Do you think that it has restor historical reasons? Because coming from a German background, I know that we have a resistance and a distrust for parliament, especially with our Nazi experience and historically. So I was wondering whether the UK version is also grounded in historical roots, in your opinion? Yes. I mean, one of the most interesting exchanges that I took part in in my time as a judge and a barrister was when I was president of the Supreme Court, we had a couple of exchanges with the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe, and a very impressive and interesting group of people they are. And we've had discussions about this. And we agreed, really, that each country system is the product of its history. And I think that Germany has got good reason to be fearful, or not, not to have complete confidence in democracy, and to realize that there are times when you need the rule of law to trump, if I dare use that word, uh, the democratic system. And uh, because sometimes the democratic system can produce results that are unacceptable. In this country, uh, we've never had a situation where that's happened. And therefore, the idea of the courts overruling uh, a decision of parliament in a statute is completely alien. But in the end, you're absolutely right. It's the product of our histories. Thank you very much. Another question? Yep, just in the front here. Thank you very much for helping out my constitutional law revision, firstly. Um, and when, when you get a fail, you can blame me. <laughs> <laughs> Kindly, Shell. Um, I'd just be really interested to hear your thoughts on public confidence in the judiciary um, and whether the disenfranchisement and lack of trust in the political branches at the moment has corresponded with an increase in trust in the judiciary or whether the media perspective coming across as enemies of the people has had an impact on, on public views. I haven't really looked at the figures. When I was Master of the Rolls, 
sort of number two in the English and Welsh legal system, uh, our um, communications people would send round each year the figures showing how many people trusted the judges compared with various other groups. And the judges never came top, but they came quite high. But I was always a bit suspicious of this and never really read it otherwise. So I don't know what the figures show at the moment. I imagine the judges do a lot better than politicians, but whether they're doing very well or coming down because of the general lack of trust in the establishment, because of the enemies of the people, because of Brexit, I don't know. Predicting what the public think is quite difficult. And on issues like that, so much depends on precisely how the question is put. And also, so much sometimes depends on whether it's been a good week for the judges in the news or a bad week. So I'm afraid it's a long-winded way of saying I haven't got the faintest idea um, what, how well the judges stand. And probably I ought to have a better idea because if I'm saying that confidence in the judiciary is important, I ought to be looking at the figures even if I took them with a pinch of salt. I suppose because now I'm retired, there's nothing much I can do about it. I can plead that it's not really much point at looking, but I ought to look, and I don't know what the figures show. Do you know? I, I don't. I, I think you're right in saying that generally judges place higher than other institutions, mm. but uh, as of late... Nurses tend to come top, and then doctors, I think, and then judges. But, and I think lawyers and... I, mean, I think lawyers do a bit worse, <laughs> and I think that politicians and, and journalists come very low. But that's what people say, and that's the other problem. It's what people say, but is it what they really think? I'm sure they're not lying, but I, I think sometimes people say things because they feel that's what they ought to say or think that's what they think. But is it really how they form their decisions? I'm not sure. Another question? Yep, just in the front here. Hi, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned um, that at the time of the Brexit referendum, a lot of people didn't know what they were voting for. And to that extent, it could be said that the outcome didn't reflect the will of the people. Now, I understand that the, uh, the outcome doesn't have legal effect, but I would still be really interested to know whether or not you think it would be more democratic or more undemocratic for Parliament to respect the outcome of the referendum. I, I think when I say people didn't know what they're voting for, what I meant was that what people knew or didn't know, I can't read into their minds. But because there are so many different sorts of Brexit and so many permutations, people didn't know in that sense what they were voting for, just as much as we don't know what sort of Brexit we're going to get today. In terms of democracy, it's a question of what you mean. If you are on the traditional side of things, you would say, ultimately, we, Parliament consulted the people but we are in a democracy which is a parliamentary democracy where Parliament makes the ultimate decisions. It would be entirely consistent with that for Parliament to say, we take into account the result of the referendum, we've seen the consequences of Brexit and what might happen, and we now decide whatever we decide, including revoke Article 50. I think that would be entirely constitutional. But I think there's a very powerful argument for saying that Parliament doing that without a further referendum to approve it uh, would be, in a sense, unacceptable. Certainly there are plenty of people who feel it would be unacceptable. Whether it's enough to make it, as it were, in practical terms unacceptable, I wouldn't be confident to say. But I think there's a powerful case for thinking that it, whatever the constitutional strictly constitutional position, it would be regarded as unacceptable for us to remain in the EU without uh, uh, the sanction of another referendum. In the end, it's a political decision, not a legal decision, because as I say, the referendum has no effect as a matter of strict law. Ironically, if it did, then it may have been that the result would have been set aside by the court because of the findings that the expenditure by the one or two of the groups involved in the referendum, broke the law. Uh, that could have led, if it had been a binding referendum, on the result being set aside in a rerun. But the courts wouldn't, wouldn't, can't get involved because it's not a legally binding referendum. 
And just to draw today's event to a close, um, perhaps on slightly a lighter note, I believe you once described your career as being peripatetic, and you know ma many students um, in this chamber will be moving on to take their first steps in their careers, uh, perhaps not long from now. If there was one piece of advice or a few pieces of advice that you'd give them, what would that be? Okay, based on my career, I would say, first of all, always be doing something, even if it doesn't seem to have much value. Don't just sit back if you've got nothing much to do or things aren't going your way. Secondly, don't give up. I, I had an odd career. I was a scientist at the university, then I wasn't very good at science, so I went into the city as a banker, what now called an investment banker, and I wasn't a very good, I was the worst banker. <laughs> and third time lucky, I went to the bar. But I find it quite difficult to get chambers. I, in those days, pupillages were easy to get, but tenancies weren't. And I had three pupillages at the end of which somebody else was taken on rather than me, and I almost gave up. And what I learned from that was, first of all, I thought I'd wasted my time being a scientist and a banker. And I, that was all useful stuff. During the later part of my career, I became a patents judge, even though I'd not looked at a patent at the bar, um, because I had a science degree, and that really helped my career as a judge. Um, I, being a scientist and a, 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 a banker, gave me a facility with figures, um, which the English education system is such that most people aren't very comfortable with figures, and I was much more comfortable. My rejection by several sets of chambers, although pretty dismaying at the time, made me realize that um, setbacks can actually be quite good for you if you are determined to succeed. They make you more determined, and they make success all the sweeter when it comes. I think that the other thing I learned was that things that seemed bad at the time and almost irredeemably bad without any apparent benefits can turn out to be good. I ended up in a set of chambers which, to be honest, were not in the same league as the chambers that I tried to join and got rejected by. But I'm utterly convinced that the work in those chambers suited me much better. Even though I, if I'd been told I was going to become a landlord and tenant lawyer, I would have left the bar. Um, but in fact, I loved it. It suited me down to the ground. It was less grand than the work which my friends were doing in commercial chambers. But it really suited me. And I think the unexpected turns of fate throughout my life have made me realize that there's a lot of luck, that what seems bad luck at the time often turns out to be good luck. You've just got to hang on in there. Um, be honest. In the law, your reputation is really important. And I've seen people at the bar who've done something stupid once and been a bit dishonest or a bit sharp. And they've marked their cards, sometimes literally for life, People will say, you can't trust him or her, you can't walk or watch them. Your reputation is very, very important. And so be, be careful about that. And then the last thing, which is not useful, I was discussing it in the car coming here with two, two people who are here, be lucky. Uh, you can't do much about that. My brother, who's a much more moral character than I am, doesn't like the idea that luck plays such a part and says, Yes, luck, of course, comes your way, but if you're skillful and clever, you'll grab your luck when it comes. But my answer to that is, you often don't know when it's come. Um, but the fact that luck plays a part, that chance plays a part, doesn't alter the fact that um, if you work hard, if you stick at it, if you're intelligent, and if you get on with people, you don't have to be charming necessarily, but if you get on with people and work with people and are willing, uh, you'll improve your chances, and that's the best you can do. So it's not very original, but I think that's what I'd say. Thank you, Lord Neuberger. Thank, Thank you. you to everyone for joining us here today at our first event of term. Um, on Thursday, we've got our main debate. On Friday, we are hearing from Bill Emmett, um, the former editor-in-chief of The Economist. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming here today and hope you'll join me in giving Lord Neuberger a very warm round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.